all get to our seats and let's stand up. Are we ready to praise God this morning or what? That's not enough people. Are we ready to praise God this morning? Hallelujah. He is worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Come all ye weary, come all ye thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. is waiting there with hope in arms oh with hope in arms for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever Now it is well, I'm walking in freedom for oh, God so loves, God so loves the world. Oh, we pray. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him. For the wonders of his love Praise God, praise God From whom all blessings flow Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Amen, hallelujah We thank you Lord For your great love God That you loved us with And Lord we just thank you That you loved us so much That you sent your son Who died upon the cross Who paid the price For our sin and he gave us his life, the eternal life, Lord, that we now thank you for so much, Lord. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. 
Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Yes, Lord. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Dennis Sandberg, and I'm one of the elders here at RLC. 
I also uh, oversee our monthly praise and prayer meeting. And uh, just a quick plug, uh, a week from this Monday, uh, please join us for an hour of power from 7 to 8 on December 5th. I pray that uh, everyone will prepare their hearts and minds to receive communion today. If anyone did not pick up their bread or juice cup, can you please raise your hand? And our blessed ushers will be more than happy to serve you with the elements. For our online guests, I encourage you also to get your juice and bread to prepare a table to receive communion. The only requirement that we ask of those partaking in communion today is that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Parents, we trust your judgment as to whether or not to have your children partake today. Sometimes I feel we come to church and we hear something to give us new information on how to live, but then we struggle on how to properly apply what we've heard to our lives. It can be like watching TV and listening to what's being said and we are entertained and the time goes by, but it really doesn't apply or give us any, require any application in our lives. And you may be sitting here right now and saying, Brother Dennis, how does this apply to communion? And I just want to remind you that when we take the bread and we drink the cup, we are taking the very body of Christ for us in, in, in our healing and the very blood that was shed for our sins. The bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. Jesus took on all our sin, all our iniquities, all our rebellion, all our disease, all our grief, all our shame. And the grape juice represents the blood of Christ, which is shed to establish a new covenant and brings about forgiveness in our lives. And that sets us apart to be holy before God. And if we take communion without applying what it means or signifies, we are just taking it emptily, and it, and it really doesn't do much to change us. And I just want to read a, a, a portion of scripture that is not typical for communion. And it's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. In the New Living Translation, it says, starting with verse 14, it says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law and with his commandments and regulations, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. And as you read this, I, I, I just, the thing that sticks out to me is Jesus brings us peace, he unites us, he broke down the wall of hostility, and then he reconciles. And a word that stuck out to me when I was reading this too is that word hostility. Hostility is about putting distance to and avoiding due to some sort of anger. I don't know about you, but it sounds a lot like unforgiveness to me. We tend to avoid or separate from people we don't like or situations that remind us of a bad memory. 
You may be avoiding a family member that you know that you should be seeing this Christmas. Let me ask you a couple questions that I want you to answer into your heart. Who by the mere mention of their name upsets you? What memory brought up continues to upset you? Many of us have been mad and upset about things that are going on in this world lately. I think that we need to all recognize that we need less hostility and more peace in our lives. You know, are, are we blaming others instead of giving it to Jesus? You know, I can't help but read this verse and say, Jesus put hostility to death. We are the ones that keep it alive. We need to remember and accept today that hospitality Hostility was put to death on the cross. Our flesh would rather point the finger and blame others for our problems. I know it's very, very difficult to, to, to just forgive people that have wronged you. Or I know how hard it is to forgive or a, a difficult memory that's happened in your past. I just want to encourage you today to take time to seek God and see what unforgiveness towards something or someone that you can lay before the foot of the cross today. We need Holy Spirit to surround us and recognize that there is healing in his wings. We all need help. And in Philippians 2.13, it says this, it is God who is working in you. He helps you to want to do what pleases him. And he gives you the power to get it. And as we partake today in his body and his blood, be expecting the power of God to work in you to forgive and end the hostility that's going on within each of us. God wants us to be free and to move and to have his being. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? At this time, can everyone take out their elements and remove the first part of it to get to the the bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, it says this, For I I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and take the bread. At this time, can you take the remaining part to peel back to get to the juice? It goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 25, in the same manner he took the cup after the supper, saying, this is the new covenant of my blood, 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Can you bow your heads? Lord, as we drink this cup, we remember that you are forgiveness. We thank you for the opportunity to be set free from any sin bondages that hinder our connection with you. We thank you for opening the eyes of our hearts to expose any hostility or unforgiveness in our lives that we have and allowed to be set free. We thank you for the healing of any physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual wounds that we may be suffering from. We thank you that your word says he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds and their pains and their sorrows. We thank you that there is life in the blood of Jesus. Go ahead and take the drink. Stand with us as we uh, continue to worship our Heavenly Father. Just pray that you let him help you. Now you 
God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to RLC. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And thank you for those of you joining us online. Good morning. Um, my name is Becky Roberts. I help out. I'm one of the youth group leaders over in Quest on Sundays. Um, I've been doing that for a very long time, but I'm still very young. So... Yeah, um, we hope you enjoyed a peaceful, relaxing Thanksgiving with friends and family. I had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I get to eat two Thanksgiving dinners. Yeah, I'm very blessed. Um, but speaking of Thanksgiving, do you know why the pilgrim's pants always fell down? Because they wore their buckles on their hats. Okay, moving right along. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you chose to join us. If you would fill out the form in your um, welcome brochure and take it to our welcome center, it's right outside um, off the foyer. Um, after service, we have a special gift that we'd like to give to you. Also, if anyone else here has a prayer request, there's also a form in the brochure for you to share your prayer needs, and then you can just drop that form in one of the offering stands or hand it to one of our very, very handsome ushers and give it, or you can take it out to the Welcome Center. Operation Christmas Child. Woohoo! An update. First of all, we'd like to thank anyone who um, packed a Christmas box for a child. We had 205 packed from our church family. So thank you. Thank you to all the people who volunteered at the drop-off center. And also, we have a new, I guess, activity along with the Operation Christmas boxes. You, if you chose to track your box, um, we would like to keep track as a church. So out in the foyer, we have a big map with some push pins. Um, once you've tracked where your box ended up, like what country it landed in, we'd ask you to take a push pin and just stick it in the country where it landed so that we can see all the areas around the world that our Christmas boxes landed. So that's pretty neat. Okay, Journey of Recovery meets this Friday, December 2nd, here at RLC at 7 p.m. There's information about this important ministry out in the foyer. Or you can um, contact Pastor Gabe or Judy Alvarez or Beth Petrosky if you will be attending for the first time. And Praise and Prayer Service is next Monday, December 5th at 7 p.m. here at RLC. If you're unable to come, but you'd like to join this, we call it Hour of Power, um, you can join us online. Just call the church office um, by 3 p.m. that Monday for information on how you can join online. And a reminder, all of our announcements can be found on the church app, Twitter, and Facebook page. And giving as well, you have many options to give. You can mail it in. Uh, we have envelopes and giving stations at the back doors um, located at our exits. You can drop your um, envelope in one of those bins online as well. You can give through our website and our church app. OK, 
Okay, moving right into the offering reflection. I'm going to read today from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 in the NLT version. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Paul was writing to the Corinthian believers, encouraging them to give sacrificially like the churches he had just visited in Macedonia. He was on his third missionary journey, and Paul had collected money for the impoverished believers in Jerusalem on this mission. And the churches in Macedonia had given enough and had given even though they were poor. And they had sacrificially given more than Paul had expected. Although they were poor themselves, they wanted to help others. The amount we give is not as important as why or how we give. God does not want us to give grudgingly. Instead, he wants us to give as Jesus Christ. He wants us to give, he wants us to give as these churches did out of dedication to and love for Jesus Christ, love for other believers, the joy of helping those in need, and the knowledge that it is simply the good and right response. We have the perfect example of sacrificial giving from our Heavenly Father. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the greatest example we have of sacrificial giving. We thank you that you gave your son for us, Lord. Father, we just thank you for this time that we can give. We ask that you use it to bless those who are in need, to further your kingdom, Lord. And we just thank you in advance for what you're going to do through our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now it's time we can dismiss. If there are any children in church, res kids, six weeks to sixth grade, can walk right through those doors in the back. Uh, anybody seventh through twelfth grade is welcome to come to Quest. You don't want to miss it. Right through those doors. And you may stand and greet one another. Thank you. Come in, have a seat. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard this before. Whoa. Whoa. You never heard that before in here. I don't know if you ever heard this, but they said that the church was the first Facebook. Because everybody connected at church, right? We don't have to connect just inside this building. We can connect outside this building. But most important, we're thankful that all of you are here in person today and all of you are here watching us online. Thanks for being with us. Um, obviously, I'm not Pastor Jeff. I have just a touch more hair than he does. But he and Debbie were able to make their way down to Atlanta to celebrate Thanksgiving with their son, Brandon. And then um, their other son, Blaine, came in from Baltimore. So they had their whole family together where it's warm. So... But it, you know, we really sometimes don't understand, and we probably never will this side of heaven, how much 
our pastors here at this church sacrificed for us. You know, pastors missed plenty of holidays away from his family and away from things. So it's good to get him to be able to go down there. And uh, God still takes care of things here through broken people. So, but thank you for letting them be there. Um, my question, I've got a couple things for you before I get into what we're going to get into today. How many people received a pretty pertinent message via their church app in the middle of the week? All right. If you didn't, hopefully you didn't make a mistake. Did anybody bake their chocolate peanut butter or their cannoli pie? <laughs> I hope not. All right. I told you the church app puts out really relevant, really relevant stuff. All right. The box with the pies, it said thaw or it said cook, but it didn't tell you what to thaw and it didn't tell you what to cook. So I hope that nobody baked their cannoli pie. But thank you for purchasing pies. The one thing I'd like you to do if you get a chance um, for you who did, we've never used this company before. Um, and we want to get some feedback. You know, I didn't try every pie. Um, I may look it, I may feel it, but I didn't. Um, so if you could just give us some feedback, yeah, that was good. No, it really wasn't that good. So that we can make a little bit of a, a change if we need to, or continue down the same road. It'd be greatly appreciated. You can see myself or Diane Lewis, who's over in the Quest Wing, just say, hey, it was really good. Or hey, you know what? So we could have done this better or whatever. But hopefully you enjoyed your Thanksgiving and it was filled with food, football, Fun and fellowship, right? But I want to continue down this road of Thanksgiving today. You know, we celebrate it one day a year, but it's a trait that should be with us every single day. We should be thankful every single day for everything that we have. But sometimes it's really, really difficult to. So today I want to talk about an attitude of gratitude. But before I do, I want to pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you. For this day, Lord, I thank you that this is the day you've met. Lord, we can rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I thank you for each person who's here in person. I thank you for everybody who's home. And I thank you for those who will watch on YouTube in the future, Lord. I ask that there be a, a piece of the word, Lord, that goes to each one of them, Lord, that they can make it their own, Lord, and that you give them new revelation. Lord, I ask that I be a mouthpiece for you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit come through me, Lord, and that I am obedient to your words. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. So as Dennis was given his, his communion message today, he said, you know, we're always looking for something new. I'm not going to teach anything that's new today. I'm going to give you a different perspective on things you've probably heard before. All right? And um, this, this all came for me myself. But today, we're going to talk about an attitude of gratitude. And we're going to start with gratitude, which is a word that we like to use. And we should be expressing each and every day. The, the definition of gratitude is being grateful or thankfulness, which I think we all have a great idea of and, you know, most likely we've been doing since we were very, very young. But there's lots of other words that go along with this. You know, synonyms for gratitude are appreciation, gratefulness, thanks, appreciativeness, thanksgiving, which we just celebrated, Acknowledgement. How many of us just want to be acknowledged? Right? You do something and you just want to be acknowledged for it. Right? Satisfaction. Indebtedness. None of us wants that. But it has to do with being grateful. Acknowledgement. Gratification. Recognition. And tribute. All these words are things we want to hear and feel from others. When we hear the word attitude, we have to break that down as well. Now, we know there's good attitude, and we know there's bad attitude, right? But what really is attitude? Attitude is a mental posture or a mental position with regard to a fact or a state. I'm going to give you an example, right? Attitude. I could say, I love snow. And you could think, I'm crazy, right? Judy does not love snow. She doesn't like anything about it, right? But are either of us wrong? No, we just have a different mental position on it, right? Many of us would think I'm crazy, but our mental perceptions are different. But I believe it's fair to say that our attitudes are shaped by our experiences, our perspectives, which reinforce our beliefs that we have. But when we put these two words together, attitude of gratitude, we get this. A mental position of thankfulness, appreciation, 
and gratefulness. A place in our mind where we're always thankful, we're always appreciative, and we're always grateful. Now, do bad things happen? Absolutely. But if we can keep this in the forefront of our brain, those bad things won't be as bad as we think they are. And we'll be able to see the blessings on the other side of them. Now that we've defined what an attitude of gratitude is, let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18 says, Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Holy cow. I love instructions. I love the, 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 it's this. All right? I don't like directions or instructions when I got to put something together. All right? But I do love instructions for my life. All right? If we put 1 Thessalonians into practice, Paul made it plain and simple. Be cheerful no matter what. How many of us find ourselves complaining rather than looking at the good in our circumstances? Two weeks ago, I, I had the opportunity to go to the New York State Phys Ed Conference for physical educators. And um, there was a man who spoke, and um, a young man, and his name was Kevin Atlas. And this is him right here. All right, that's Kevin. Some things you, you're, you're not going to know about him. The dude is 6'11". All right? He, he's a tower. All right? The other thing you're not going to know about him is he's the first player to ever get a Division, one, a Division I basketball scholarship with one arm. All right? He played for the University of Manhattan. He played four years there, and he was a successful college basketball player. But we may look at this and think this is really, really bad. All right? But I want you to see Kevin's perspective of it. Even before entering the world, Kevin should have died in childbirth. His umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck twice, but he survived because his arm was in the middle of it, allowing the blood to flow to his brain, but it cut off the circulation of his arm, and his arm died. He was born without a left arm, and obviously it ended at the elbow. Many people may look at Kevin only having one arm and believing that he's angry about it, but Kevin is cheerful about it amidst the circumstances. He's cheerful no matter what because he understands what the potential could have been. So often, we, think we may get down and we may complain about our blessings that come to us in disguise. All right? The other thing about Kevin is, all right, that arm that's there, he, when he started playing basketball, the coach said, get that arm as strong as you can. So up on stage when he was there, he had his arm, and he had a grown man come up. And he put his arm out, his nub, he calls it. And the dude was actually doing pull-ups off it. That's how strong he got it. But how was this a benefit for him while playing basketball, a two-handed sport? He was 6'11". He was a center. He stood in the middle of the court. So what he would do is he would throw his nub right in the middle of the guy's chest. And there was no way he was going to get around it. And he'd post up and get the ball, and then he'd score. So what we would look at as a disadvantage or something to be negative about, he embraced, and he wouldn't have it any other way. And he wouldn't be as successful as he is. Now the other thing is, as Kevin was talking about his challenges in life, he travels all around the world now being a motivational speaker for teens and youth and stuff. He shared a Bible story in front of a thousand phys ed teachers. They were in an auditorium, and he got there, and he was talking about the woman who was in adultery, and that we've all sinned, and if we're going to cast a stone, then, and in front of everybody. So not only does he understand that he's blessed, he's a Christian, and he's spreading that word all over the world. So good for him. But as we move through our busy lives, let's work on being cheerful no matter what. We've heard Pastor Jeff say several times, there, there was nothing good in the moment of his motorcycle accident. In the moment, there was nothing good. Now, some of you don't even know that Pastor Jeff was involved in a serious, serious, serious motorcycle accident many, many years ago. 
All right, he was going down 49. Somebody decided to do a U-turn. They pulled out, motorcycle hit it. He went flying, ended up in a mud pit, broke his ankles, did a lot of damage. And it wasn't good in the moment. But in the moment that he realized he was alive, it became better. Right? And then we got to see all these blessings that happened because of it. All right? One, the people who continued to run this church when he wasn't there was a huge blessing. All right? But he would tell you, as crazy it may be, he wouldn't change that for anything. In the pain, the suffering that he still goes through today, he would keep it because of how close it's drawn him to Christ. All right? So however, there are things that may not look good, but we need to be cheerful no matter what. Because we can be rest assured that this, in Romans 8, 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. God has a plan for you, and it's a good plan. It's not a plan of death and destruction, all right? But there's only one requirement. You have to love him. And if you believe that, it's going to be good. We cultivate an attitude of gratitude by being cheerful no matter what, because we know God is working all things for good. The second part of 1 Thessalonians 5 goes on to say this. Pray at all times. We may have heard it before being said, pray without ceasing. This gives us an attitude of gratitude. Why? Because prayer gives us a constant communication with God. James 4.8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It doesn't get any simpler. All it takes is us taking a step towards him, and he becomes closer to us. But we've got to draw near. Drawing near to God aligns us with God's perfect will for our lives. Let's think about Jesus, the night he was betrayed in the garden. Jesus had flesh and feelings, and he knew suffering was ahead at the cross. Let's look at Matthew 26. Then he walked a short distance away and overcome with grief. How many of us have been overcome with grief before? That's all of us. You know what that shows us? Jesus was just like us. All right? But he was so much different than us as well. All right? He threw himself face down on the ground and prayed, My father, if there is any way you can deliver me from this suffering, please take it away from me. Jesus didn't want to go through the suffering, just like we don't want to go through suffering. But he understood what was on the other side of it. Jesus was prepared to face the future after he prayed in the garden for the removal of the cup and his suffering. But God didn't remove the cup of suffering. He still had to endure the physical and spiritual pain of the crucifixion. Jesus' prayer did not change his circumstances but it did change his spirit and his heart. We don't pray to change God's mind. We pray to let God change ours. What do you want me to say it again? We don't pray. Sorry, I never had that happen before. (laughs) We don't pray to change God's mind. We pray to let God change our hearts and our minds. Praying at all times gives us a closer connection to God and helps us to come in alignment with God's perfect plan and will for us. Isn't that desire we all have and that we can all be very gracious for? Now let's look at the third part of 1 Thessalonians. Thank God no matter what happens. I look out here and I see a lot of your faces and I know a lot of your stories. And in the midst of things, It's not easy to thank God. It's not. All right? But I know I look out here, a lot of you, you're thanking God for what you went through because you're seeing his faithfulness in it. Hold on. Who has a problem with this? Thank God no matter what happens. I will say it's a struggle for me. But my question is, why is it a struggle? I know I serve a God who loves me. But why be thankful when crappy things happen? Why? Because the only thing I deserve is death. Because I'm a sinner. I must always be thankful in the worst circumstances because he gave Jesus up for me. 
Why must I thank God no matter what? Because of his grace and mercy, he shows me each and every day. Why must I thank God no matter what? Because he has a perfect plan for my life, one bigger and greater than I could ever imagine. Why must I thank God every day, or no matter what? Because he already has the victory, and we are on his team, which win, means we win also. Thanking God no matter what helps me build the attitude of gratitude, which God wants me to have, and more importantly, wants me to live. Let's take a look at what Paul shared with the Philippians. Let's remember, Paul didn't have the easiest of roads. At different times in his life, he was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, and arrested three times. So for him to say and live the following words means a lot and is a great example to us today for living in attitude of gratitude. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7 say, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand, we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul totally understood the attitude of gratitude. This scripture is very similar to 1 Thessalonians, which we just looked at. In my eyes, praying at all times and praying about everything are very similar. And when combined together, makes for a very, very powerful prayer life. Thanking God no matter what, and thanking God for what he has done, brings us back to a place of being thankful for the things he has done for us, seen, unseen, deserving, and most importantly, undeserving. When we take a look at the first part of 1 Thessalonians, we recall it says, be cheerful no matter what, which is similar to Philippians 4, 6, which is where Paul says, don't worry about anything. Worry and cheerfulness, total opposites, but when we put them together, exactly the same thing. Be cheerful no matter what. Don't worry about anything. How many times has your worry stolen your cheer from you? Right? But when we focus on that cheer and what God's done for us, there's no possible way we can worry. We will get... Uh, sorry. So if we are cheerful no matter what and we don't worry about anything, we will receive, we will get what it says in verse 7. We will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace, which will guard our hearts and our minds as we live in Christ Jesus. With God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand, there is no way we cannot display an attitude of gratitude. Now, I want to take a turn and show you a story in the Bible where gratitude is on display. I always believe sharing scripture is critical, but making scripture come alive by making it relevant and applicable to today shows us how it applies to our lives. It is a story that you may be familiar with, but there's a lot going on inside of it. So let's take a look at the story of the ten lepers. I will read it com the, the passage complete, then we'll take a deeper dive into it. So this is Luke 17, right? We're going to go 11 through 19. And this is in the message. It says, It happened that as he made his way towards Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. They went, and a while they were still on their way, they became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said, Were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, Get up on your way. Your faith has saved, healed and saved you. So there's a lot there. We're going to unpack that 
All right, there's a whole lot that's going on, and I sort of want you to, to think about it a little bit deeper. All right, so it goes on to say that in the very, very first part here, in 17, or uh, yeah, in 11, it says, it happened that as he made his way towards Jerusalem, obviously we're talking about Jesus here. That's an important thing to understand. He crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, 10 men, all lepers, met him. Now think about it. This is Jesus walking into Jerusalem, a town which at the time was about 25,000 people, okay? If it was during feasts or something like that, it could be four or five times bigger than that. But during this time, about 25,000 people there, all right? In 2021, Rome, New York, right here where we live, had 31,974 people in it. So this is a small town that's just a little bit smaller than Rome. And we consider Rome pretty big, right? But not compared to LA or Philadelphia or anything like that, right? But just to give us a little bit of relevance here. I bring this up because do you know when people come and go from Rome? I've got no idea. I've lived here all my life besides when I was in the military. There's people who live here who I haven't seen in 20 years. All right, I don't know when they come and when they go. These men knew that Jesus was coming into town. You know what that means? They were looking for something. And they knew what they were looking for. And they knew what it had to offer. Let's take a sidebar for a minute and talk about what a leper is and the rules they had to adhere to. Physical leprosy was a skin and flesh disorder that brought about literal decay of a person's body while they still lived. Your body started to rot. The first signs of leprosy were white spots on the skin. We don't often sing about leprosy, but we did today. God's pretty good, huh? Lepers often did not know that they had leprosy until they accidentally cut or injured themselves because they were without feeling. They didn't have any feeling of pain. This was because leprosy deadened the nerve endings and did not send the proper signals to their brain. Eventually, grotesque sores emerged across their bodies and their flesh began to rot. As leprosy progressed, lepers' skin dried and their f flesh de degenerated. After a time, fingers, toes, ears, and other parts of their bodies, including their nose, could fall off. That's pretty crazy. And actually, I had somebody during service who was, who was talking about something. There was times, and it's actually written in history, where there was a man who had leprosy, and he looked out, and there was a mouse eating his finger, but he didn't know it because he couldn't feel it. That's pretty crazy. That's just pretty out there, right? So these people were suffering, is what we're getting down to here, right? At the time of Jesus, there was no known cure for leprosy, which left the lepers without hope. Socially, which is totally different, the lepers also suffered anguish. Leprosy was highly contagious, and there was no known cure. Lepers were ostracized. They were forbidden to have personal contact with anyone, including their family and friends. Jewish law required that those with leprosy shout, unclean, unclean, when people approached them to avoid contaminating them. And they were cut off from all society. Now that we have a little background about lepers, let us jump back into the story. These lepers had no easy life. Living a life of isolation while suffering from infection and discomfort is not an easy life. The only way that I could possibly relate this, and this is nowhere even close, all right, but this is a stretch, is think about the most severe sunburn you've ever had in your life combined with COVID, right? You had to isolate yourself, be away from everybody, right? But you were in this intense pain, but we didn't have parts falling off our bodies, all right? So a little bit similar in that. But let's remember that we only had to isolate ourselves for 10 days, these men, we had no idea how long they were in social isolation, how long they suffered from their symptoms, and how long 
they had to be away. But what we do know is they saw Jesus as he approached them. Let's jump back into scripture. They kept their distance but raised their voices calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. For me, this part of the scripture, there's a few takeaways. First, they showed honor to Jesus by keeping their distance. We don't know how far away they were from Jesus, but we know they were far enough away where they had to raise their voices, shout, scream, or yell. The second thing they used was the word master, which is translated in this passage to be chief commander. In our society today, we can't even use the word master anymore. Realtors are not even permitted or aren't even using the, room, the term master bedroom anymore due to its negative associations. Now we have primary bedroom or owner's suite. It's pretty crazy. Master, to these men in desperate need, shows they believe Jesus was in control of everything, even disease and death. In our lives today, is Jesus master? Someone who controls us? or someone who has everything under control. These men somehow knew Jesus was capable, what, cap what he was capable of and wanted what he had. They put their faith and trust in the master. Thirdly, they said, Jesus, master, they said, have mercy on us. They didn't limit Jesus. I find this amazing, right? If we were sick or hurt, we ask us just to heal us from that sickness. They said, have mercy on us. They included so much more in their words. They didn't limit Jesus to just ask for healing of their leprosy. They surely could have gotten. How much different is their request when they say, have mercy on us? They're asking Jesus to give them what they don't deserve. Not just healing, but freedom from bondage, freedom from disease, and wholeness. What I find to be awesome is in their general faith-based requests, Jesus knew exactly what they desired and gave them exactly what they needed. How much does that, this reflect his faithfulness to the lepers on that day and to us today? Jesus knows exactly what we need even before we need it. Amen. Jumping in to Luke 17 verses 14 through 16 It says taking a look at them Right, so now he's close enough where he can actually get a good look at them You know, I look back there and I can see Eric back in the back row Right, but I don't know with these lights if I can see everything about Eric, right? So they're, they're closer now because he can see what's going on All Right taking a good look at them. We have some more information about Jesus and how close he was He said show go show yourselves to the priests this is a very important part of the story that many of us don't know about. Those words brought faith to these ten diseased men. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, it says that the priest must examine the diseased person to deem them clean or unclean. They knew that if they were going to the priest, they were up for examination. And Jesus isn't a trickster, so he wasn't going there so that the priest could turn him down. An opportunity for them to live a normal life once again. These two were, these two next works blow my mind. The words that they say, they went. They didn't see a, he see a healing at the time. They didn't ask why. They went. How many times have we had that inner Holy Spirit nudge where we know we're supposed to do something and we didn't do anything? These men didn't see anything. They didn't see a change. He told them to go and they went. How much different would our lives be if we obeyed the Holy Spirit in that fashion? When they went, they displayed faith that Jesus is going to change their circumstances. They didn't know how. They didn't know why, and they didn't know when. They just trusted. 
I saw a quote this this week that was very convicting to me. It said, many trust God with their eternal salvation, but not with their temporary situation. Let me say it again. Many trust God with their eternal salvation. We'll trust him with eternity and the rest of our life, but I can't trust him when my car breaks down. Right? Think about it. We trust him. We put it out there. I'm going to heaven, but I can't trust him that he's going to pay the bill. We're not defined by our temporary situation. We're, ch- we're defined by our eternal. And God's faithful. He's going to work things for good. How true is this in our everyday lives? God is faithful. He works all things out for good. There's no other place we should go, no other place we should trust. We can learn so much from the lepers. Then the scripture goes on to say, they went, and while they were on their way, they became clean. They were healed. They turned, they walked, they took their marching orders, and as they're walking down the road, imagine this, right? These guys who were all broken and frail and everything, they had to stay away from him. All of a sudden, his finger reappears. Right? His nose starts working again. He can actually smell. He can feel the sand underneath his feet as he's walking that he never felt before. Right? This has taken place as they're walking. It's absolutely amazing. They didn't have to see it happen and they go, oh, I've got to walk. They just started walking. And he starts to change this because they were, they were obedient to what he had to say. Their bodies were restored. Sores started to heal. Feelings and life were brought back into their bodies. And I bet they even got a little bit of pep in their step. Think about if there was people around them. People always had to stay away from them. These are the men who always said, unclean, unclean. Now they're walking right down the middle aisle. And they're walking with a purpose to go see the priests. And as they are, things are changing about them. They don't look the same way. They don't posture the same way. They're walking with a whole new confidence. They're restored. But the scripture goes on to say this. One of them, when he realized that he had been healed, turned around and came back. How many went to the priest? Ten. How many turned around? One. This is sort of like society today. How many thank yous do we hear? Right? Thankfulness and gratefulness, it's, it's, it's being lost. But we can keep this attitude of gratitude if we're grateful for the things that we've done. We can learn a lot from this man. Ten received the healing, but only one recognized where the healing had come from and came back to show gratitude. I don't know how your creative mind runs with this picture, but I picture a child at Christmas getting that one gift that he or she wanted and screaming at the top of their lungs with amazement and awe that they received it. The man who returned to Jesus when he was there was showing gratitude and glorifying God. The scripture says he kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful that he couldn't thank him enough. When's the last time we couldn't thank Jesus enough? Think about it. It should be an ongoing process. I could only think that these shouts of gratitude faded away and turned into tears of joy at the realization of Jesus' faithfulness and love that he showed this man as he accepted and humbled himself receiving this gift of healing. And more importantly, he was a Samaritan. Now that's not just there for the heck of it. That's a huge important part. When we really do an analysis on what a a Samaritan is, a Samaritan was an enemy of the Jews. They had no good for them. Two people apart. But what this shows is Jesus' love, Jesus' healing, all the things he has to offer are for everybody and not just an an exclusive group. If he's going to do it for Mark, then he's going to do it for Pastor Gabe. If he's going to do it for Kalani, he's going to do it for Gabe. 
If they're going to do it for people in this church, he's going to do it for people outside this church. He's going to do it for people who know him, and he's going to do it for people who don't know him. He wants it for everybody. And that's what this word right here, he was a Samaritan, shows us. Everybody thinks Christianity is this big exclusive group that, no, God loves everybody and he wants it for everybody. It just takes a choice. Our God's bigger than that. What we need to remember is this Samaritan man, just like us and just like people who don't know Jesus, was created in the image of God. And God has a great love for him as well because God is good. Jesus goes on to say, were there not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none of them be found to come back and give glory to God except the outsider? I don't believe God or Jesus was ever confused in his life. All right? And this isn't the first time. He was asking a question where he knew the answer. All right? But what we need to remember here is he can do math. He saw 10 go. He saw one come back. But why did this one come back? This one re realized what he got. And this one, this just happened to me in between service. So I'm going to go with it because somebody gave me revelation. All right. It said that he sent them to the priest. And he had, they had to go to the priest because the priest would tell them that they were deemed clean. This man who came back to Jesus wasn't disobedient because he was actually more obedient than the other men because he realized who the priest was and the priest was Jesus standing right in front of him. He understood it from the start. He didn't have to go anywhere. But so often we get confused by who Jesus is and what he really has to offer us. We often take our blessings for granted. If our health and our homes and our friendships, God wants us to be grateful for them all. But too often we get content in enjoying the gift, but forget about the giver. We are quick to pray, but slow to praise God for what he's accomplished. The scripture closes with Jesus saying, get up on your way. Your faith has healed you and saved you. What type of faith are we displaying? Are we walking through our lives with an attitude of gratitude like this Samaritan man has? Being cheerful and hopeful no matter what? Praying for God to do work and giving him thanks whether we see the work or whether we're waiting faithfully for the plan that's to take place. We have the ability to go through each day with an attitude of gratitude. But it's our choice whether we do or not. This choice should not be based on our circumstances or the news we receive. This attitude should be because we know God is faithful. And if he's willing to perform a miracle for a Samaritan person, then he's willing to perform one for you. Amen. I can tell you that this very week, while I was preparing for this message, there were several times where I had my attitude of gratitude stripped away from me. The enemy just wanted to come in and say, you're preaching about this, but you're not living it. All right? And we know the scriptures that says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Right? So I'm going to give you two terrible examples of what the enemy tried to do this week, but that the God's got victory in. I just had to order $3,000 worth of merchandise for the lacrosse teams that I, I oversee. It's all coming in. It's Christmas gifts. The parents bought it for their kids so they could have it for Christmas. It all came in, and it was the wrong color. All the shirts were supposed to be royal blue, and they're purple. All the shorts were camouflage, and the, where the camouflage blue was, they were purple. The enemy tried to steal my joy. He just wanted me to get down and out, and I was angry. But you know what I said? No way. God's going to work this out for good. He knows what's supposed to happen, and it's all taken care of. And more importantly, it's supposed to be here by Christmas. So, ha ha, let's take that. All right, the other thing, right? My car is supposed to go in for repairs tomorrow. I got hit 
about a month ago. Not bad or anything. I'm good. But I'm supposed to get my car repaired. So I've got the, the, the car guy worked out. I've got my rental car. My insurance is paying for worked out and everything. And I went to go see the guy. And guess what? The door that's supposed to get fixed isn't there. My car's not going to get fixed tomorrow. But the enemy just wanted to go, take that, sucker. But he's not going to. He's not going to steal it. Because I can have an attitude of gratitude that I still got a car that runs. It just got a dent door. We just got to have an attitude and understand that even in the smallest or biggest of things, God's still there and he's still in control. For me, having an attitude of gratitude is something I try to live out daily. And what makes it possible is knowing where I was up until the age of 25. I didn't have Jesus in my life. I was nothing but a mess. Embarrassed to tell some of the stories and things I did. Not proud of any, a lot of the things I did before 25 because it was all about me and it was not about anybody else. But what Jesus has done in the last 22 years is absolutely amazing. And I wouldn't write the story any other way because he's good and he's faithful and he's true. He's been a major part of my life the last 22 years. And it's God's faithfulness during the tests and the trials that leads me to believe this. He hasn't failed me yet, so why would he fail me now? Really, think about it. He hasn't failed me yet, so why would he fail me now? When we think about all the things we've gone through, and we really look at them in retrospect, there's lots of good going on in the middle of the mess. So if he can do that then, why is he not going to do it now? If he can heal the Samaritan man, why is he not going to do a healing now? If he can forgive sin then, why is he not going to forgive sin now? He's going to, because he hasn't failed us then, and he's not going to fail us now. I know that it can be easy to lose an attitude of gratitude, especially when the world comes crashing out on us. I caution you that the same God who was in control when everything was great is the same God who's still in control when everything doesn't look good or feel good. We should always be reminded that our attitude of gratitude should not build on our feelings because feelings are not facts. Feelings change. They can be up, I can be down. It's just like watching a Syracuse basketball game. You could be yeah, and then you could be yeah. Right? It's the truth. We all know it. All right? Feelings are false. They're, they're, they're false. They're not fact. They change all the time. All right? Our emotions can lie to us. Our ability to keep our attitudes of gratitude should be grounded on one thing. God's faithfulness. How can we be reminded of his faithfulness? We can get into his word and we can see the great thing that he has done. And we can do a simple exercise. We can count our blessings, not our problems. Amen. Our problems have the ability to overwhelm us. But when we focus on our blessings, we can start to be grateful for all the blessings God has given us. And it builds an attitude of gratitude. It puts focus on what God has done for us rather than the issue, issue at hand. This is similar to what I taught the last time I was up here when I talked about worshiping through our worry. All right? When it's all coming down, take your focus off of what's holding you down and put your focus on what's been good. If it's, we're worrying, we put our focus on God, he's going to help us get through the worry. When nothing looks good, we can count all the blessings we have and we can change our attitude really, really quickly. We must keep our eyes on God's faithfulness in the past, today, and to believe that it will remain faithful for the future. Just this week, you know, we talk about faithfulness and things that we see and testimonies and things like that. And at this time, you guys all should have a card that says gratitude card on it. And if you don't have a pen with you today, all right, Eric back there has got some pens. I'd ask you to put your hand up because you're going to need a pen to do what we're going to do. All right. But just this week, I had the opportunity to hear from a couple of people who were in some pretty bad times. And um, so what are you grateful for? What, what, what's going on? And, and one of them had just lost their husband. And she said, you know what? In losing my husband, it was a terrible thing. 
was awful. But you know the blessing out of it? I got to pray for his salvation before, before he died. Now, in the midst of losing her husband, she was grateful that she got to pray for him for his salvation. You know, there's somebody else that goes to this church who this week has felt tremendous pain for years. Has felt tremendous pain for years, but somebody prayed for them, and they're pain-free. They're pain-free. God's still working. He didn't just work in the Samaritan man and stop. He's still working today, right? So what I want you to do, your gratitude card that you have, I'm going to ask you to do something we don't, I don't know if we've ever done it here, but I don't often do things that are normal, so it's all right. I want you to think over the next couple minutes in your head, not just like Thanksgiving, oh, I'm thankful for my brother and sister and things like that. I want you to think deep in your knower, what are you grateful for? Why do you have an attitude of gratitude? What is your, your single testimony on why you stand? What's your pillar on why God's got you still standing today? Where's your hope placed in? What keeps you there? I'm going to share this with you, okay? Some of you know, some of you don't know. About two and a half weeks ago, my stepdad, Bob, who usually sits over there, he was for your first service. He got pretty sick. And at about midnight on a Sunday night, I received a phone call. It was my mom, and she was frantic. Imagine that. Um, and she said, Bob's in bad shape. The ambulance is here. And I could hear the ambulance guys in the back of, back of the phone and stuff. And he said, I'm not going to the hospital. And they're like, we can't make you go to the hospital. That's kidnapping. You got to tell us you want to go. And he's like, I'm not going. So I got him on the phone. And I said, hey, do this. Go to the hospital. Not for me, not for mom. Go for your grandchildren. That, sw- that, make, that changes something there. It, it just re, it resets your mind. You go to the lowest thing you can go to and use it because it'll work every single time. He said yes. All right. But before I got to the house, or as I was going to the house, obviously I, I was speeding, which shouldn't have done. Don't do that. All right. I was praying. God, please just take care of this, whatever it may be. I got there and the ambulance was still there in the driveway. And I walked through to the ambulance. I opened up the back door and I've never, and I've never, 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 seen my stepdad the way he was. I've seen my stepdad through two heart attacks and quadruple bas- bypass surgery. I've seen my d- stepdad through two strokes. I've never seen him as grave as he was. And I walked up in the ambulance with the two guys in there, and they thought I was crazy. And I put my hand right on his head, and I said, in Jesus' name, you're healed. And he said amen, and I walked out the doors. Not knowing what I was going to find when I got back to the hospital. Went inside, got mom together, put some stuff away that we need to, and 30 minutes later, I've seen grave before, okay? I've, I've seen that grave, that grave feeling. I've had to work on people who were in grave condition, all right? Not by choice, just by, by being at the right place at the right time. My dad was grave. Gasping for last breaths, gray face, doom in his eyes. I've never seen doom in his eyes before. All right? I didn't know when I got to the hospital what I was going to find. But 30 minutes later when I got to the hospital, I saw a totally different man. Amen. I saw a man who had no doom in his face. He had hope. I saw a man who wasn't struggling to breathe, but was breathing on his own. I saw a man who actually knew where he was now because he didn't know where he was when he was in the back of the ambulance. If God can do that for him, and he's done it how many times? The guy's a cat for crying out loud. He's got nine lives, right? He can do it for any of us. But we got to believe in it. We got to believe that what we say in his name can happen. Because God wants it. God wants it to happen. So that's my testimony, my latest that I'm standing on. I could go back. My daughter was in my arms at seven months old. She had to lose three inches of her intestine, but God kept her alive as she was bleeding in my arms. I can go to where I was a mess and God picked me up. Those are the things I stand on. My question is, what do you stand on? Where's God's faithfulness in your life that when you lose all hope and you can't have an attitude of gratitude, what do you hold on to say, you did this so you can do this. You didn't fail me then. You're not going to fail me now. So what I want you to do is take two or three minutes and I want you to jot it down. I don't want you to put your name on it. 
Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to acknowledge, God, you did this for me. You were with me then, so that you'll remember later, he's going to be with you then. And the other thing we're going to do with these, the only people who are going to see him is the pastors. Because you know what? Sometimes our pastors find themselves in a valley, and they can pick this up, and they can say, you know what? Look what God's doing. He hasn't stopped. He's not going to stop. I'm going to keep working. All right? So that's the purpose of this. This isn't to get into your personal business or anything like this. This is an acknowledgement. When you take it from your brain and you put it down on paper, you remember. All right? Tommy Hawkins, what is it? The weakest ink is what? The weakest ink is the weakest link, right? When we, we don't remember everything we put in our head, but if we write it down, even the weakest link is going to stay with us. All right? So write it down. Keep it. Have it there forever. And then when everything's going bad, we got it. All right? So I'll give you two, three minutes to do that. This is like a teaching thing. We do this in schools, you know. <clears throat> So what I want you to do is, when you're done today, and you get, if you've got to take a little bit more time, please do. You at home, if, you're, if you want to do this exercise, you put it in the comments box of, the, of the, um, the website, or you can throw it right up on Facebook, whatever it may be. But give God his glory. Acknowledge it. Because he's acknowledged you. He's acknowledged you. So when we do this, what I want you to do when we're done today, fold it in half, put it in the offering uh, things back there. We'll collect them. We'll keep them. We'll give them to the pastors. More importantly, we'll be praying about them and for them, all right? But, so as we go through our days, let's be reminded, reminded of what the scripture said that we need to do to live an attitude of gratitude. First, we must be cheerful no matter what. Sometimes life isn't fun. Sometimes life isn't good. But I can guarantee while you're going through it, if you can live it, cheerfully, no matter what's going on, it can give you an attitude of gratitude. Secondly, we want to pray all the time. We want that constant connection, that constant communion with God. Because when he knows what's going on and we know his will for us, it helps us keep that attitude of gratitude. And the last thing is thank, excuse me, thank God no matter what happens. God's got the perfect plan. The perfect plan might not always look right to us. But if we understand that his plan is always perfect, we can get freedom through that. Because he works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. With all that I've said today, there's only one true way to have an attitude of gratitude. And that's to have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I would also like to give everyone listening and those here today the opportunity to put their trust in God and make him Lord of their life. Having a personal relationship with Christ and having the Holy Spirit within us as a guidance system is what will help us walk down God's path. For those here in the sanctuary and those at home, let's bow our heads and pray this, this together. If you're here today and you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Everybody, just repeat after me. Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I recognize my need for forgiveness and I surrender my life to you today. I accept Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior. Please show me your path 
and help me become the person you want me to be. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're here today and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the very first time, uh, I'd ask that you tell one of the ushers, to myself, Pastor Gabe or somebody, so that we can get you plugged in and headed in the right direction. If that's you at home and you did that for the very first time, please, you know, send us a, send us a message on our contact sheet on the website. Uh, let us know so that we can be praying for you. Uh, it's really, really important. We would like you to always remember that God is with you. And salvation is the way and the only way to keep an attitude of gratitude. But with all he eyes closed and all heads bowed, I know this isn't easy. And if you're here today and you struggle with this, it's a struggle to stay positive. It's a struggle to keep your eyes on Christ. And it's a struggle to keep that attitude of gratitude. I'd just like you to slip your hand up because I'd like to pray for you. And we want freedom from this bondage. Thank you, Father. Thank you for these lives, Lord. Thank you. Dear Lord, I thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for each and every person who's here, Lord, that has heard your word today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that where they struggle, Lord, you can give them strength. In their time of weakness, Lord, that you can bring them joy. Lord, your word says that all of us who are heavy laden and burdened, Lord, can come to you and receive rest. So, Lord, when our attitude of gratitude is struggling, Lord, and we can't think about all the things you've done, Lord, let us be reminded that you sent your son Jesus to die for all of us, which has brought us freedom, healing, and all good things. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. would you all stand, please? So this morning, as I was driving here, this is what I got to see. God is amazing. Right? This was just the way he painted the sky this morning. Right? But attitude of gratitude. If you got nothing to be thankful for, nothing, be thankful that you've got breath and that the sun rises every day. <laughs> right? Really. When it's that bad, put your hand on your heart, feel your heartbeat, and say thank you. Because there's times where it's going to get that bad. And we need, we need to go back to the simple things. I've got a heartbeat. I've got breath. The sun rose this morning. God did it yesterday. He's doing it today, and he's going to do it forever. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that as we leave here, Lord, that your words stay with us, that you f allow us to understand which part of it was for us, Lord, and that you allow us to apply it. Lord, we thank you for the strength to get through the day. Lord, we thank you for the words to say to those around us, Lord. And we thank you for the testimonies that can only be done because of what you've done for us, Lord. We'll be sure to give you all the praise and the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for being here.